This advanced cruise ship is a luxury hotel on the high seas. Here's an LNG tanker. It can carry enough gas to supply 200,000 households for a year. And this is a car carrier ship that can hold 8,000 cars. These ships and a huge variety of others are made in Japan, a shipbuilding superpower. State-of-the-art technology and traditional know-how consistently place Japan among the world's largest shipbuilders. Since ancient times, the Japanese have been making distinctive boats suited to the country's climate. This has given rise to unique shipbuilding techniques. The Japanese passion for shipbuilding gave the world its largest super tanker. In recent times, research to make ships more environmentally friendly has resulted in new and innovative eco-ships. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at shipbuilding. We'll learn about ships made in Japan and discover how Japan became and continues to be a global leader in shipbuilding. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. I've come to Tokyo Bay, which is a hub of Japan's maritime trade and sees some of the world's heaviest ship traffic. Japan is completely surrounded by the sea. Ships bring in raw materials and energy and then carry out cars, appliances, electronics and other manufactured goods to the world. Japan's annual trade volume is somewhere in the region of 900 million tons and 99.7% of that is moved by ship. Without shipbuilding, there would be no vessels to move any of those goods. Ships are essential to Japan's way of life. First of all, let's take a look at the sort of ships that are built here. Japan is a shipbuilding superpower. In one year, it constructs ships totaling 20 million tons. About one-fifth of all the world's ships are made in Japan. From ferries and high-speed ships essential to an island nation like Japan, to freighters and tankers, Japan prides itself on building cost-effective ships of all types and sizes. Let's look at some leading examples. First, a car carrier used to export motor vehicles. Japan is one of the world's largest exporters of motor vehicles and in Japan the car carrier has evolved in unique ways. Inside, car carrier ships are much like parking garages with around 12 decks designed for efficient loading of vehicles. On some car carriers the height of the decks can be adjusted according to the height of the vehicles. The car carrier must pack the greatest number of cars into the least amount of space. The cars are parked just 10 centimeters apart, door to door, and 30 centimeters bumper to bumper. Specially trained drivers load the vehicles with almost superhuman precision. The largest class of car carrier can fit around 8,000 passenger cars. Next, we have oil tankers, which carry the crude oil essential to powering Japanese industry and everyday life. At 330 meters long and 60 meters wide, 300,000 ton class tankers are the largest ships at sea. Their holds are usually divided lengthwise into two or three chambers. This enables them to carry different types of oil on the same voyage. In addition, it prevents excessive shifting of the oil when the ship is at sea. Many kinds of ships are essential to supporting the Japanese way of life. How exactly are they made? Imabari by the Seto Inland Sea in Ehime Prefecture is one of the largest centers of shipbuilding in Japan. A giant ship like an oil tanker is assembled out of several blocks. Factories build each block 
and then the blocks are assembled in a dock connected to the sea. This efficient method of shipbuilding, called block construction, was developed in Japan. This is the manufacturing line for steel plates that will become the ship's hull. Gas torches are cutting the plates in shape specified by the blueprints. A 300,000 ton tanker is built from around 100,000 steel parts, weighing in at 35,000 tons. The bow and stern have complex rounded shapes, designed to reduce water drag. The curved smoothness of the hull is essential to a ship's performance. The making of these complex curves continues to be the province of skilled craftsmen. Steel plates several centimeters thick must be bent to just the right curvature. Japanese artisans perform this craft as well as anyone in the world. A gas burner heats the steel plate, causing it to expand. Water is sprayed on and causes the plate to cool and contract. After repeating this process many times, the curves are ready. Both the flame and the way the water is sprayed on must be subtly adjusted to produce the exact curves in the blueprints. The fabricated steel plates are welded together. The welds on a single oil tanker measure about 950 kilometers. In welding too, Japanese craftsmen boast world-class skills. This is the bridge, containing the ship's control room. It's being outfitted with wiring and equipment. The completed bridge is lifted to the dock by a crane. Once the bridge is attached, the ship is nearly complete. From the beginning of block building to its completion, this giant tanker took only six months. State-of-the-art technology and superb industrial craftsmanship power the success of Japanese shipbuilding. I'm in a shipyard now in Chiba Prefecture and there's some big steel plates here which are being bent using the techniques that we've just seen in the video. And I'm going to be talking to one of the men who works here, Mr. Takashi Hirao. He's going to hopefully clue me in on what's going on here. We're now making a 300,000 ton tanker. Wow, it's a big one. Right. Can you explain what's going on? What, what are these big steel frames here on top of this plate? These are bending templates. The plates are bent according to the curvature of these templates. This one, for example, takes a worker about 12 hours to bend. You can see that these, this thing is curved in different degrees in different parts. So if somebody has bent a plate too far and it then needs to be corrected, how would you go about that, for example? If a plate has been bent too far, you can heat it from the underside like that and bend it back into shape. Roughly how long does it take for somebody to master these skills? Generally speaking, 10 to 15 years. Here we're seeing a block being assembled. This one's going to be part of a 170,000 ton bulk carrier and there will be about approximately 200 of these blocks making up the whole ship. This one is part of the engine room and we're seeing some pipes being installed over there. Normally those pipes would be up at the top so the worker would be having to look up to install them but because it's done in this block style they can turn the whole thing around so it's easier for the worker to put them in and then after it's all finished they can turn it 180 degrees round to install into the ship. Pretty nifty. Okay, let's move on now and take a look at the history of Japanese shipbuilding. In Japan, ships were first built in large numbers in the 5th century. Archaeologists have unearthed clay models of boats from that time. Japan began to use iron tools in those days. Woodworking became much easier and shipbuilding took off. A type of boat called a dugout was carved from a single log. Later, side walls were added. 
The resulting craft was a uniquely Japanese creation. Japanese boats were built mainly for transport along the coasts. They were designed with flat bottoms so that they could move around in shallow waters and come ashore anywhere. Later, up to about the 10th century, large Japanese ships carried out numerous diplomatic voyages to China, including missions to China's Tang Dynasty. These missions brought back many elements of Chinese culture to Japan, including Buddhism and a system of central governance that reshaped Japan's political and cultural order. But out on the rough open seas, these flat-bottom ships lacked stability, and many sank. The next evolution in Japanese ships came in the 15th century. Advances in techniques used to make wooden planks gave birth to ships with new structural designs. Instead of a single log, these ships had bottoms made of multiple planks fitted together. The sides were built higher and reinforced with great numbers of beams. Now ships could be larger and better able to withstand voyages on the high seas. On 17 occasions, the rulers in those days dispatched large trading vessels like these to Ming China. The trade ships returned with copper coinage from China. At the time, Japan was quickly becoming a money economy and the coins fed the booming demand for currency. In the mid-19th century, the arrival of Western ships served as a catalyst for Japan's opening up to the world. That prompted major advances in shipbuilding. From the late 19th to the early 20th century, there was a worldwide revolution in shipbuilding, from wood to iron, and from sail to steam. A parade of new ships, powered by paddle wheels and propellers, took to the seas. Japan joined this global revolution. Not to be outdone by Western powers, Japan invested heavily in shipbuilding, especially the construction of warships. By the 1930s, Japan took its place among the shipbuilding powers and eventually built the Yamato, the largest warship of its day. But with Japan's defeat in the Second World War came devastation of the shipbuilding industry. The situation began to improve two years after the war's end. A new national policy turned Japanese shipbuilding towards commercial vessels like freighters and the industry quickly stabilized and flourished again. In 1956, Japan overtook Britain to become the world's largest manufacturer of ships. The golden age of Japanese shipbuilding had begun. And this is the dry dock of the shipyard and there's a ship being put together here that's almost ready to go. This one's a 56,000 ton bulk carrier. That's about a third of the size of that ship that we saw a block being put together for a moment ago. Now, the blocks are put together for these ships with enormous cranes. And as you can imagine, there's a very intricate teamwork called for between the crane operators and the people guiding them. It's absolutely essential. Just look at the size of this anchor chain, let alone anything else. It's absolutely vast. Ships are constructed of thousands of components made from all kinds of different materials, and supplies come from virtually every sector of industry. That's why shipbuilding is considered so essential, because it reveals a country's overall level of industrial development. In 1956, Japan became the world's largest shipbuilding country by tonnage, but that was because of low costs and Japan's technology was not yet considered first class. It was around that time that a project was launched to try and build the world's largest tanker, and that drew global attention as the country's shipbuilding technology was put to the test. Let's now trace the story of how the nation put its reputation on the line for a project of unprecedented ambition and learn something about the people involved in that story. In 1963, 
a major Japanese shipbuilding company received a request to build the world's largest oil tanker. At the time, the oil market was dominated by a handful of US and European companies called the Majors. Japan had no choice but to purchase from them at high prices. A Japanese oil company decided to turn the tables by building its own tanker and importing crude oil directly from the Middle East. The shipbuilder's engineers immediately began working on the design. The ship was to be called the Idemitsu Maru, a super tanker capable of carrying as much oil as Japan used in a single day. At 200,000 tons, this tanker would be the largest in the world when completed. From all around Japan, companies clamoured to take part in its creation. 1,000 companies and 360,000 people undertook this monumental challenge. Kunio Minamizaki supervised construction. The project began in 1966. Minamizaki vowed to show the world that Japan had the technology of a shipbuilding superpower. But this effort to build the world's largest tanker faced many hurdles. There was a burning drive. We all wanted to tackle this challenge. The first difficulty to be surmounted was the material to use for the ship's hull. The steel plating available at that time would have sunk the ship. So the designers opted for high tensile steel, an alloy including manganese and silicon that weighed the same, but offered at least 1.5 times the strength. This in turn enabled the plates to be made two thirds as thick. The problem with this material, however, was welding it. High tensile steel is welded with molten metal. The amount of metal applied and the temperature determine the quality of the weld. The key is a toughness that can withstand impacts. In test after test, the welds would break. Inspired by Minamizaki's determination and words of encouragement, the engineers put their heads together. They decided to focus on the welding agent. From more than 100 different minerals, they searched for the combination that would produce the most reliable weld. The result was a welding agent made from more than 10 different minerals. The main ingredient was magnesium oxide. Testing began once again. Everyone prayed it would work. Although the weld cracked, it did not completely snap. The test was a success and the welding of the high tensile steel began. Another challenge was installing the massive drive shaft. The drive shaft connecting the engine and propeller needed to run along the exact center of the hull. But for some reason, the bearings along the way were not centered and the shaft could not pass through them. Inspections were carried out, but the bearings seemed to be in the right positions. It was then that the engineers noticed that some parts of the ship were in the sun, while others were in the shade. They measured a 20 degrees Celsius temperature difference between the steel panels on the starboard and port sides of the ship. The ship was so large that thermal expansion was having a significant impact. So late at night the measurements were retaken and as soon as the bearings were found to be in alignment, the giant drive shaft was installed. Construction now moved forward quickly. The engine with 33,000 horsepower was the largest in history. The turbines were smaller versions of those used in thermal power plants. And the propeller was another new size record, 7.8 meters across. Construction now proceeded smoothly, and in December 1966, 
the Idemitsu Maru was completed. It was indeed the world's largest ship. Six days later, it departed on its maiden voyage to Kuwait. Minamizaki had done all he could. Now he prayed for the ship's safe return. I just pray, please may it come back safely. After filling up with oil, the Idemitsu Maru encountered a gigantic out-of-season typhoon on its return voyage. Winds blowing at more than 100 kilometers per hour lashed the ship. Waves poured onto the deck and the hull groaned from the pounding. The ship plowed on, full steam ahead. With its 33,000 horsepower roaring, the gigantic drive shaft spun. The huge propeller kept turning. And the high tensile steel stood fast against the ferocious waves. Forty-two days after leaving Japan, the Ide Mitsumaru returned safely. Japanese technology had kept the ship safe through the storm. Until it came back, I was praying the whole time. The ship gave us confidence, I think. Over the next 12 years, the Ide Mitsumaru made 100 round trips to the Middle East. It was a lifeline for Japan's economy. Orders poured into Japanese shipyards from around the world. Japan achieved 70% market share in supertankers, those over 200,000 tons. The building of the supertanker showed the world the technical capabilities of Japanese shipbuilding and established Japan as a shipbuilding superpower. I've now come to the Museum of Maritime Science where they have on display numerous ships that were all built to meet the needs of their times. Because all ships are made to order, no two are exactly alike. Each one is a monument to the ingenuity of its engineers. Take a look at this rather odd-looking ship. Its two submarine-like hulls give it buoyancy and they're connected above the water to the upper part of the hull by a thin steel superstructure. The hulls are largely undisturbed by the waves, which gives the ship stability and speed. This kind of ship is used for passenger ferries and special applications that need a large, stable deck area. For some 50 years in the post-war era, Japan was number one in shipbuilding, but in recent years, emerging superpowers South Korea and China have made enormous growth through their low costs. In terms of tonnage, the three countries, China, South Korea and Japan, now build something like 90% of the world's ships. However, in order to survive, Japan's shipbuilding industry is now being forced to adopt some new tactics. This is a cement transporting ship built at a shipyard in Kure, Hiroshima. The ship is equipped with not one, but two propellers. One is turned by a diesel engine and the other by an electric motor. In other words, this ship is similar to an eco-friendly hybrid motor vehicle. There is a secret to these two propellers. The forward and aft propellers turn in opposite directions to optimize the flow of water and provide more efficient propulsion. This system makes operations more fuel efficient than a conventional diesel ship of the same size and is expected to cut CO2 emissions by 5 to 20 percent. At this shipyard in Osaki Kamijima, also in Hiroshima, a ship with new environmental technologies has been developed. It looks like an ordinary cargo ship, except for the large holes in the bottom. There are 16 holes altogether in the bottom of the ship. Because much less steel plate was needed, the ship's weight was reduced by more than 10%. This raises fuel efficiency and makes the ship more stable.
A.G. Koike is the president of the shipbuilding company that developed this technology. It all started with a flash of inspiration. I was taking a bath with my grandchild, and as I was playing around, it suddenly came to me. When he turned a wash basin upside down and placed it in the tub, it floated because of the air trapped inside. Koike thought it might be possible to make a boat work even if it had no bottom. So he devised a plan to make a ship with many empty compartments in the hull and a blower to fill them with air. He thought it would float. He built a detailed 1 30th scale model and with the help of a university, tested it in a tank that simulated the harsh conditions at sea. A challenge was how to right the boat when it tilted. Koike's plan was to use a computer in the control room to adjust the air blown into the chambers in the hull. If the ship lists to starboard, it blows air only into the chambers on the starboard side to level the ship. This enables the ship to right itself more quickly than a conventional ship. This new technology developed by Koike is expected to attract interest from abroad as well. Japan shipbuilding companies will have to continue developing innovative marine environmental technologies like this in order to fend off international competition. Japan, surrounded as it is by the sea, has a long history as a maritime nation and it's always made use of the sea and its resources. But now it's not so much a case of Japan being protected by the sea as Japan trying to protect the sea. And further innovation in environmental technology will be needed for Japan to retain its status as a shipbuilding superpower in the future. I'll see you again next time. Next time on Begin Japanology, we once again begin our talk show series, Japanophiles. Our first guest is Bruce Hubner, a shakuhachi flautist who hails from the US.